going to be focusing this morning on the first part of 1 Kings 19, but we're going also to look at some of the chapters leading up to that in the stories of the prophet Elijah. Elijah was living in the worst of times. You've heard the famous line uh, from A Tale of Two Cities, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And in many ways it was the best of times because Ahab had made a very good move. He married Jezebel. And Jezebel's daddy was the king of Sidon. Sidon had major trade routes under its control, and the money and the riches just poured into Israel through that alliance with Sidon and through that marriage to Jezebel. So it was the best of times, but it was also the worst of times because money wasn't the only thing that poured into the kingdom through Jezebel and Ahab. A lot of wickedness and evil and false religion poured in too. And so God had said already back in the book of Deuteronomy, if you break my covenant and worship other gods, I'm going to make the sky like brass and I'm going to make your ground like powder and there's not going to be rain. And he sent the prophet Elijah with the message, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Now Baal was the God of rain. And so... If you were counting on Baal for rain, we would see how he would pan out. The weatherman gave his forecast, and it was not the three-day forecast. It was the three-year forecast, as it turned out, and he had the word from the Lord. And meanwhile, God was going to take care of Elijah himself. He sent him out to a brook, the brook Cherith, where um, Elijah was able to have a water source for a while and to drink, and God brought him food from from the ravens, and the birds carried food to Elijah. When the brook dried up, God gave Elijah more directions. He sent him to a widow in the land of Sidon. Sidon, the land where Jezebel's king, where Jezebel's father was king. And meanwhile, as we learn a little later, Ahab and Jezebel have their agents, their assassins, out looking for Elijah everywhere, and they're checking out where he might be hiding so they can kill him, and he's hiding right in the kingdom of Jezebel's father. And Baal is, has got his stronghold in Sidon, but that land also is dried up. So when Elijah gets there to this widow, he's really not going there because that land is any better off than Israel, but God has given him directions. And he asks for that cake and for that drink of water, and she says she really can't afford it, but she does it anyway. And God promises that the, flour, the jar of flour shall not be spent, the jug of oil shall not be empty, till the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. Then the little boy gets sick and dies later, after Elijah's been living with them a while, and the widow says, What do you have against me, man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son? That's sometimes how we reason when something goes bad, we're quite certain that at last, God has decided to zap us. And sometimes it's true. The, that's why Israel was very dry, was because of wickedness. And yet not everything bad that happens is a direct punishment for sin. In fact, it can be the first step for God to show his glory. So Elijah said to her, give me your son. And he took the boy upstairs and laid him on the bed. He cries out to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, have you brought calamity even on the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Oh, Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. And God answers the prayer. The life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. In the prophecies and ministry, by the way, of Elijah and Elisha after him, we see many miracles, the biggest burst of miracles in the Bible until someone greater would come, and even miracles of raising the dead. God was giving a foretaste and a foreshadowing of what he would accomplish in Jesus. Well, then Elijah is prompted by the Lord to say that it is about time to meet with Ahab and the people of Israel, and it's, the Lord is going to restore rain to the land again too. So Elijah picks the person he's going to meet. Um, Ahab's chief of staff is out looking 
for water sources and food and that sort of thing. And Elijah comes to Obadiah and he says, tell Ahab I want to meet with him. And Obadiah says, oh, come on, Elijah, you're just trying to get me killed. Um, you, maybe he thought Elijah was trying to get him killed for working with Ahab at all. You see, he, Obadiah was not a prophet. He was a politician. Elijah would stand in the face of a king and a queen and tell them off. And Obadiah was a smoothie. He knew how to pull the strings and keep his head just low enough not to get it shot off. And Elijah lived out in remote places in prayer. And here was Obadiah working in a palace. Man, that Obadiah, he's not near the guy Elijah is. Or is he? Is it harder to live out in the desert or to live right under the gaze of the wickedest king and queen in the history of Israel and do the Lord's work right under their nose? Sometimes we criticize politicians because they're not prophets. But not every politician is called to be a prophet. Some of them are simply called to be there to keep the damage to a minimum. A prophet may have a different calling than that politician has, and Obadiah was a devout and great man of God. It, um, you know, some of you don't go for those stories, but I'll just give you two names for those who do. Dumbledore and Snape. One is working right under the gaze of the vicious killer. The other one has a very hard job too, but it's more in open opposition, but not always with the villains. Well, anyway, Obadiah says, if I go and tell Ahab and he doesn't find you, he'll kill me. Yet I, your servant, have worshipped the Lord since my youth. Haven't you heard, my Lord, what I did while Jezebel was killing the prophets of the Lord? I hid a hundred of the Lord's prophets in two caves, 50 in each, and supplied them with food and water. And so Elijah promises, okay, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not trying to get you killed. Just get Ahab and bring him back. And Ahab, when he saw Elijah, said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? And, he tr and Elijah answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have in your father's house because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord, and followed the Baals. Ahab and Jezebel were always blaming the messenger. But, in fact, it was they themselves who had brought all this trouble on Israel. So Elijah calls for a showdown, and he says, I want to gather all the people together on Mount Carmel. And he gets the people there, and he came near and said, How long will you go limping along between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. But don't try all of the above. You do have to make up your mind. And the people did not answer him a word. Elijah chose Mount Carmel, um, maybe in part because he wanted this to be on the other team's home court. Mount Carmel was about as close in Israel as you could get to Sidon and to Baal's territory. And Elijah decided, well, in this contest, let's choose Baal's specialty. He's supposed to be the god of thunder and lightning and rain. So let's have a lightning contest. Whose God runs the lightning? Whose God can send fire from heaven? And just to make it a little more um, favorable to Baal, I'll be the only prophet of Yahweh here, and we'll give you guys 850, just to give you a little bit of a running start. And I'll let you pray all day. I'll pray for one minute. Um, you can get the best firewood you can possibly find and have it all ready so that the slightest spark will set it off. And I think I'm just going to um, make it a little tougher, just for fun. Fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. Do it a second time. They did it a second time. Do it a third time. They did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. So after... The prophets of Baal have been howling all day and cutting themselves and trying to get their God to do something. Elijah has all this water poured out and he prays his one minute prayer. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. 
Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. So Elijah's sacrifice was just vaporized and the people cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God, and they killed all the false prophets of Baal. Well, Elijah says um, to Ahab, now, God's going to send rain. And then he says to his servant after Elijah's been praying, go up now and look toward the sea. And he went and looked up and said, there's nothing. And he said, go again, seven times. And at the seventh time he said, Behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. He said, well, you got to get out of here. Uh, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down lest the rain stop you. And then the sky instantly clouds over and the rain starts pouring. The heavens grew black with clouds and wind and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went on to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. So he outruns Ahab's swiftest horses. So here's some recent highlights. Elijah's had a pretty good winning streak. He speaks the word of the Lord that stops the rain. He receives food from God-sent birds. He eats widow's food that never runs out. He raises a dead kid to life. He tells off a nasty king to his face. He calls down fire from heaven. He wipes out the idol-worshiping priests. He speaks the prayer that brings rain, and he outruns the royal horses. You know, not bad. Should change everything now. Well, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then Elijah was afraid and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, Mount Sinai, the Mount of God. And he arose and ate and drank. Oh, sorry. And then he came to a cave. There he came to a cave and lodged in it, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper, a still, small voice. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and Jehu the son of Nimshi you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel Meholah you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall, put Je shall Jehu put to death, and the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet 
I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. This ends the reading of God's word, and God always blesses his word to those who listen. Burnout and breakdown. A lot of us get to the edge of it, sometimes even over the edge of it. And it can happen for a variety of reasons. And when it happens, it's very difficult and, and devastating. And sometimes it comes after a mountaintop high. That mountaintop high turns into this dreadful low. You have a thrilling triumph one day, and it seems to make no difference the next day. Elijah had this big winning streak, and you'd have expected that at last to change Israel and to change Ahab and Jezebel, and it just didn't happen. His expectations did not come true. He was again hunted, and it was just too much. And when you get this burnout and, and breakdown, it just seems like, you can't really even put your finger on it after a while. A, a dark, cold fog just clouds your spirit and settles around you. And you become more and more discouraged. And life seems not worth living. You feel like a failure. Society, um, sometimes the burnout comes from personal circumstances and, and devastating struggle in your own life. Um, sometimes it's added to by what's going on in the world around you. Maybe your workplace is a disaster. Maybe it's very hard to work there. Maybe your family life is a struggle. Maybe it's just that society just seems to keep getting worse and nothing seems to halt it. Elijah looked around and said, Man, this king and queen and the powers that be and the way this whole society is set up is so far gone there's no hope for it. The government is hurting. It's doing more harm than good. The church is rotting. And it's shriveling. There's fewer and fewer. And the ones that there are, seems like a lot of them seem to want to follow false gods and false preachers. And in the middle of all that, I'm a failure. I'm a loser. My life was supposed to be making a difference. And the only thing that's gone on is people are hunting me. I wish they'd catch me and I were dead. And it hasn't made a lick of difference. My life has not made one bit of difference in this whole huge mess. It's hopeless. And that's how the prophet felt. That's how some of us can feel from time to time. And it's not something where you can just snap your finger and say, now I want to feel better. Well, the, pro, uh, the apostle James says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And one way he had a nature, he's reminding us that Elijah had a nature like ours because sometimes you look at Elijah's life and you say, wow, you know, that's one of these religious superstars and I, I got nothing in common with him and nothing he did is relevant to me. And James says, hey, Elijah was a man just like us and when he prayed, look what his prayers did. The prayers of a righteous man are powerful and effective. He prayed fervently that it might not rain and for three years and six months it didn't rain on the earth. And then he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth bore its fruit. And so James wants us to know that Elijah was a man who had weaknesses like ours, struggles like ours, and that he nonetheless did mighty things for God and his prayers prevailed. And our prayers can have power like Elijah's because Elijah was a man like us and we have a God like Elijah's, not just a God like Elijah's, we worship the God of Elijah. Elisha once said, where is the God of Elijah? And the Lord acted. Maybe still today we need to ask, where is the God of Elijah? And so we can be comforted that this man with a nature like ours, a man just like us, did such mighty things. We can also be reminded when we do have these downtimes that he was a man just like us. When we become depressed, when we feel like giving up, we're in good company. Elijah sometimes felt that way. Jeremiah sometimes felt that way. We'll read in Jeremiah this week where he says, I, I just am so upset. I, I just feel like packing it in, Lord. Um, you see, whenever people dealt with Elijah, they thought he was a tough guy. And when they dealt 
with Jeremiah, they thought, man, this guy's got to hide like a rhinoceros. Everything just bounces off of him. Nothing seems to trouble him. He's just getting in our faces every day and driving us crazy. And every time this guy speaks, bad stuff happens. Man, is he mean and man, is he tough. Well, actually, neither of those men was particularly mean. And I guess they were tough if, because the Lord was with them. But when nobody else was looking, when they were off by themselves, they spent a, some time in discouragement. They were fragile men. As the Apostle Paul said in the New Testament, sometimes we got to the point where it seemed like death would overwhelm us. We, we have this tremendous treasure, the riches of Christ, but it comes in these jars of clay. And we're very fragile and very weak. And when we read the Bible, it's encouraging in a way to find out that these heroes of faith were people just like us. They, even in their public role, when they were tough and mighty and got in the face of kings, were not so tough. They, they struggled. They were scared to death of some of these meanies that were out to kill them. They were discouraged that God wasn't coming through for them and doing what they thought he ought to do when he ought to do it. Um, and... So if nothing else, it's helpful to know that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. What did Elijah need? Let's think about that just briefly for a moment. Um, one thing he needed was get his body back in shape. He needed something to eat and something to drink and some really good sleep. For a good many people who are going through burnout, part of the problem is how your body is, not everything, but make sure you're taking good care of your body. We see it in little children, of course. Um, you know, if your four-year-old is really, really cranky and it's about bedtime, you don't send that little four-year-old um, to somebody, you know, to find out what's the matter. You put them to bed. Um, we've had kids who could get super cranky around 545, and you could either um, get really upset with them or make sure you got some food to the table pretty quick because when you're hungry or when you're sleep deprived it's hard on you now that doesn't explain everything that people go through when they're feeling just weighed down and burnt out but never neglect the physical element um, you know if you're always burning the candle at both ends and your spirit is depleted it, it may be time just to pay some good attention to your body again and the Lord did that. He sent his angel. He sent his angel with some uh, food, with some drink, and Elijah is just zonked out, and the angel wakes him a couple times to eat, and so he's got some rest, and he's got some nourishment. Now, in Elijah's case, of course, it's quite extraordinary. He literally, uh, he's got the best diet you can get, angel food cake, and, <laughs> you know, that, that will go a while, and that angel food cake carries him for 40 days and 40 nights on his trip to Mount Sinai. Now, sometimes when we enter the period of Lent, which is a 40-day period, people think about, now what do I need to give up for Lent? Because that's, you know, that's kind of a, a habit for some. What, what should I give up for Lent? And there may be a place for fasting from this or giving up that. For some people, maybe what they need for Lent is some angel food cake. And they need to receive refreshment and kindness and blessing from the Lord and realize that Lent is a, is a commemoration of Jesus giving himself as our life and of being refreshed by his Holy Spirit. And it's not always, I mean, there may be circumstances where it's healthiest for you to deprive yourself of something for a time. It may be a time to treat yourself to something for a time because of all that God has done for you. It may depend on your circumstances a little bit. At any rate, a worn out body needs to be refreshed. And a burnt out spirit needs to be renewed. And sometimes you do need to get out of the hustle and bustle and get away from the rat race and get away from those hassles and troubles and spend some time with God to hear God's voice, to experience God's presence, to rejoin God's mission and his purpose for you. To get clear again, who am I? What am I here for? And just spend that time with the Lord, hearing his voice and understanding what he wants to do with you and through you. Now, again, I'm not going to pretend that every person um, fits just these categories. That for some, it may take...
time with a Christian friend, with, with a wise counselor. There may be other aspects to this. But certainly, take good care of your body. Take good care of your spirit. Spend some time with God. That's what Elijah needed above all. And when he went out to Mount Sinai, when he went into that cave and was listening and trying to find where is God in all this, um, he heard that still, small voice. And as we think about that still, small voice, I want to point this out. Signs and wonders don't usually change hearts. What was Jezebel's reaction to fire from heaven? It was to order Elijah's death. What was the reaction of Jesus' opponents to all of his miracles? And in particular, his miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. They had been plotting to kill Jesus, then they added Lazarus to their hit list. That's what miracles do for the hard-hearted. And so, Elijah's had this power from God to do some amazing things and some great miracles. The only trouble is that sometimes that quiet whisper will do something that none of the miracles can do. And that quiet whisper may just turn out to be the strongest thing there is. God controls the wind. He controls the earthquake. He controls that fire. He controls all things. And in one sense, God is present everywhere. But in another sense, God's presence and his will are rarely expressed in these noisy, flashy displays of power. He often simply comes quietly to a spirit waiting for him and looking for him, and he whispers. And that whisper somehow makes all the difference in you, and that whisper just might turn out to make all the difference in the world. That still, small voice of God coming near is worth more than all the outward fireworks in the world put together, because what is whispering to you is the very word that brought the universe into existence, the very word that decides what happens with the history of the world, the very word that rules empires and sets up kings or brings them down. And this voice that speaks to Elijah is shaping the destiny of nations. The voice is quiet. It's often ignored. But that quiet voice was the one that told Elijah, no rain for three and a half years. That quiet voice was the voice that said, okay, Haziel's in as king of Syria. Jehu's in as king of Israel. Um, the prophets of Baal and the followers of Baal are going to get slaughtered by these kings who are being set up. And, oh, by the way, I have a successor for you. And so you have this voice, which is barely above a whisper, and it controls the whole world. We need to understand that this invisible whisperer who we wish would make himself a little more obvious sometimes uh, is doing just fine. And he's not panicking, and his cause is not failing. Now, Elijah's lonely. He feels all alone. He gives this speech a couple of times. I, even I alone, am left, and they're out to kill me, and then, Lord, who do you got left? You know, then it's all over. Your cause on earth dies with me. Well, God has people in unlikely places. Elijah's been a little forgetful. Obadiah is operating right under the nose of Ahab and Jezebel, and he's not a Baal worshiper. Now, he, he's a politician, not a prophet, but he's a faithful follower of the Lord, and he's working right under the nose of the Lord's worst enemies. You move to the New Testament, and you find out that some women from Herod's own household are following Jesus and helping to fund his ministry. The Apostle Paul is being held prisoner in Rome, and the evil Nero is on the throne, and meanwhile, some of Nero's Praetorian bodyguards are becoming Christians. And so... You read these things in the Bible and you say, okay, when we start having this little pity party, let's not forget that in the very palaces of the evildoers, God has his own. If you look in the world today, that the headlines are about a Christian pastor who is sentenced to death because he allegedly converted from Islam, which is punishable by death. But why do you think they're so desperate? Why do they always have to do what they do by the edge of the sword? Because they have nothing else. And 
when you think that the forces of terrorism are the strongest in the world, terrorism is almost always a sign of powerlessness and of desperation and of trying to get your way somehow because you're not doing very well. Right in the stronghold of Islam in Saudi Arabia, there are many, many people who are worshiping the Lord right now. Iran and Algeria are known to be two of the places with the most radical forms of Islam in the world. When someone did a secret poll, which people probably weren't going to honor, on, answer quite honestly in the first place, even then more than half said they didn't even want to be Muslims. And this is in the two most devout and extremist countries in the world. It is very important not to misread the signs just because some explosion makes the news or some death sentence makes the news. Sometimes right in the palaces and right in the proximity of the evildoers, the Lord is doing his work. Oh, by the way, God does have other prophets. We get a very selective memory when we're clouded with burnout and breakdown. It's just me, poor me. Nobody understands. Nobody is on the Lord's side anymore. Well, he just was told that a hundred prophets had been rescued by Obadiah, and just because he doesn't see them all, well, they, it's kind of understandable that they're keeping a fairly low profile. Doesn't mean they're not there and that they're not working with the Lord's people. Obadiah kind of assumed Elijah would know about those hundred prophets. He didn't assume Ahab and Jezebel would. But he figured that word would kind of spread by the grapevine among the Christians of who the good guys are and of the fact that there are still prophets at work throughout the kingdom. Well, Elijah knows, but he doesn't know. That's one of the strange things about us. We know stuff, but in the moment of crisis, sometimes it, it seems unreal, even though we know it to be a fact. And very often, what we most need is simply to remind ourselves or have God remind us again of what we already know of the facts that are already there and have them become realities to us again. And it's not just that he has more prophets. God always keeps a remnant. And it may be a whole bunch bigger than a discouraged leader might think. There were 7,000 who never bowed to Baal at all. And who knows how many others besides those who never bowed to Baal at all, may have turned away from Baal and back to the living God because of the ministry of Elijah and because of the ministry of those other discouraged prophets. Who knows what God accomplished? We do know one thing. An awful lot of people there on Mount Carmel yelled, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God, and they offed the prophets of Baal. I suspect there were some genuine converts among that crowd who turned back to the Lord. And so once again, Elijah knows things that have happened, but all of a sudden, in the moment of sorrow and despair, those things just aren't on his radar. The only thing he knows is he's alone and Jezebel's out to kill him. Well, there are more facts to be considered than that. As Paul said at the end of the great chapter on the resurrection, Therefore, dear brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. When you labor in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. The Apostle Paul picks up on Elijah's pity party in the New Testament when he's talking about the problem of many Jewish people not believing in Jesus as their Messiah. And he says, does that mean the word of God just failed? He says, no, I'm a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin. I follow the Lord, and the Lord has others too. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they've killed your prophets, they've demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. God always has his remnant. His grace accomplishes its purposes. And that means that um, where, when we're discouraged, when we do feel like those uh, jars of clay that are just about getting smashed, we should remember that we are still in the Lord's hands and that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And once we're done with the pity party for ourselves, 
don't have a pity party for God. He is accomplishing his purposes, sometimes through a remnant, sometimes through a great flooding in of people. There are times of revival. There are times of drought. And whether if you're living, if you're living as a prophet in a time of drought, well, then so be it. I, I love Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a great preacher in Britain at a time when the church in Britain was sliding downhill and downhill and getting worse and worse. And at one level, that's very discouraging. But at another level, Lloyd-Jones said, what a time to be a preacher, that God would choose me and put me in this situation and entrust me with the word of God when it is so difficult. He didn't say, oh, boy, I wish I lived in the time when you had to wave one finger and mumble a couple of words and everybody got converted. You know, that, I, that would be great too. You know, he, wasn't, he was praying for revival and seeking it, but at the same time he said, what a privilege it is to be called to stand for the Lord at a time when it's really, really hard. I love another old Puritan preacher, Richard Baxter, who preached and did have tremendous fruit on his ministry and saw thousands and thousands of people converted. And somebody said, well, how do you feel about, you know, the success of your ministry when those who came here, you know, in this area before you um, didn't accomplish much? You, you know, what are you doing that, that makes you so great? And he said, well, there were faithful men who came before me who plowed on rocks. And by the time I got here, the soil was ready. So sometimes it's our job to plow on rocks. Sometimes it's to plant on lots of good soil. Sometimes it's just preparing soil. But either way, God is going to accomplish his purposes. He has not rejected his people. And so you and I need to trust him and look forward to living in whatever time we live in and living faithfully. Whether we're on a winning streak, whether we're in a very difficult position. I've quoted it many times, the quote of G.K. Chesterton. He was um, echoing Jesus' promise, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. And Chesterton said there's at least five different times in the history of the church when it seemed the church had gone entirely to the dogs. And each time it was the dog that died. And you must always remember that. Each time it is the dog that dies, not the church. It is Baal who goes, who remembers Baal today except those who read the Bible and hear him spoken of. Baal was one of these false gods who demanded the worship uh, of people and offering their sons and daughters as sacrifices to him. What a horrible God. He's gone, forgotten, except for those who are offering their children today in different forms. But the fact is that the Lord continues to be worshipped. And all the other pretenders are left on the dustbin of history. Will God's cause die with me? Um, Elijah thought so. He thinks he's alone, but God already has Elijah's successor in mind. Elijah, Elisha, in fact, is going to do even greater miracles than Elijah did. When you read about the career of Elisha, man, there are even more miracles, and they're astounding. And how about you or me? Now, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm dear to God. He can do great things through me. Sometimes I need to know that, that my labor's not in vain, that he's going to do and is doing great things through me, and, well, he can also get along without me. He can carry on his work when I'm gone because his cause doesn't depend on me alone. Elijah that prayed to die, well, this is one of those prayers. Elijah was a mighty man of prayer. This is one of those prayers that never did get answered. You know, the Lord didn't let him die then and there. In fact, he never let him die at all. Later on, God just took him straight to heaven. Sometimes it's not that bad if we don't get an answer to prayer. But two things, never forget, just as Elijah was told and learned, God's kingdom on earth can keep going even if you're gone. So don't get despairing about God's kingdom. And when you're gone, you're not quite gone forever. You go to be with him in heaven. So either way, you win. You're here on earth, whether plowing on rocks or bringing in a big harvest, you're doing God's work. And then when that work is done, and not before then, he'll call you home and you'll get to spend forever with him in glory. These are the facts. Sometimes when Jezebel's out to get you, 
Sometimes when things are going very bad for you, those facts can be overlooked or they seem unreal compared to all those realities that surround you. But this is the reality that stands when everything else passes. Crowns and thrones may perish, kingdoms rise and wane, but the church of Jesus constant will remain. Gates of hell can never against that church prevail. We have God's own promise, and that cannot fail. We thank you, Lord, for your unfailing promises. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, and for the Holy Spirit who whispers faith into our hearts and by his still small voice comforts and guides us. We pray, Lord, that we will always be attuned to that voice and we will realize again the power of the Word, the eternal Word of God by which you made the universe and our Lord Jesus Christ, the incarnate Word of God. And we praise you too for the written Word of God which gives testimony to these things and reminds us of what is real. Lord, help this reality to be the dominant one in our lives. When there's a lot of clatter and noise, much of it discouraging, help us to hear again the voice of your Holy Spirit speaking hope and love and truth into our hearts and lives. Lord, for those today here who may be discouraged or despondent, who um, just wonder what their own life amounts to and are having a hard time going on, be their strength and their help and their wisdom and lift them up. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen.